2 Corinthians chapter 12 in your Bibles this evening. On Thursday nights, we've been looking at the topic of stewarding life. Uh, not squandering it, not wasting it, not spending it, even if we're spending it for the Lord. Not spending it because what you spend, you'll eventually run out of. But rather than squandering, rather than spending, we're talking about stewarding our lives. Whether it be our time, whether it be our thoughts, we looked at that the last few weeks. Uh, whether it be uh, our health, our energy. How many of you this evening uh, can remember back when you were a kid, and maybe some of you still are kids, <laughs> ever trying to figure out what was wrapped inside your Christmas present before Christmas? How many of you did that? Try to figure it out? How many of you did more than try to figure it out? You picked it up and shook it? Yeah? How many of you dare try to unwrap it and see? Went that far. Some of you. Good. How many of you say, Pastor, forget when I was a kid. I still do that today. All right. Some of us. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you ever try to find yourself in the same way, trying to guess the value of gifts that God sends your way? I wonder what God's got in mind with this one. Huh? I wonder how this is going to benefit. Sometimes we quickly recognize some things that the Lord sends our way as personally profitable. Sometimes he blesses us with certain relationships. Yeah. Aren't you glad when he blesses us financially? We see that. Sometimes he blesses us with, with time to accomplish what's needed. We eagerly receive those blessings and we diligently, at least we should work to steward uh, them so we gain their fullest potential. And yet there are other times, things that perhaps the Lord gives, but certainly the Lord allows, that we don't try to recognize the value. How about those times when all of a sudden find ourselves unemployed? Or chronic illness, lest we hear the word cancer. Or a loved one passes away. These are the gifts, so to speak, if we want to call them, that we just as soon pass over, huh? If we could, we'd send them back, return to sender, right? Uh, with a no thanks. Uh, I, I, I mention often on Thursday nights, Linus and Charlie Brown, they've talked about this as well. Linus says, you know, I don't like to face problems head on. I think the best way to solve problems is to avoid them. In fact, this is a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or so complicated that it can't be run away from. <laughs> we, don't, of course, don't want to think of it that way. My thought for us this evening, and as we look through our lesson tonight, is as we're stewarding life, what about stewarding trials? How do we steward trials? In fact, I'm going to need a couple of volunteers this evening. You don't have to, don't worry, you won't have to sing. You won't have to act. You won't even have to speak. You'll just have to choose. How many want to help me with something this evening? Did you notice? Anybody notice we got gifts right down here? Okay, you have noticed. We're not decorating for Christmas, okay? Heaven forbid there's Thanksgiving. Those of you that already listen to Christmas music, that's a whole other message. Uh, we're not going there yet. Uh, but I've got some gifts you all can choose. They're, they're labeled as well. Who wants to be first? Come choose a gift. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Peter, come on. Hey, this is fitting. Good. He had his birthday last week. Good. Someone else. We're going to need a few. How about anyone? Miss Deborah? Okay. Choose, choose any of these. You can choose, but don't open them. Just pick one up and show me which one you... Oh, that's what I thought he was going to go for. Tell everybody what you chose. New car. New car for Peter. Good. Good. Why don't you uh, take that with you? Don't just don't come up. I mean, don't open it yet. All righty. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Tell everybody what you chose. $10,000. $10,000, Miss Virginia. I'll just give you the one that I think you're going to choose. Okay. All right. She'll choose that one. A promotion at work. Okay. But she doesn't need that. I mean, see, I'm not working right now. Well, it looks like my computer just died. So we're going without the TV for a little while, but that's okay. I'll give you what we're going through. All righty. Who else wants to come? Miss Tanya. All right. Jeremiah, come on up. We need one more. One more. You're not going to like any of these. Miss Debbie. All righty. 
Which one are you gonna choose? Ooh, she's ooh. Ooh. She's gonna choose alrighty. Death of a loved one. Death of a loved one. Aww. Don't open these gifts yet. Which one are you gonna choose, Jeremiah? I can't help it. Unemployed. Unemployment. Alright, Miss Debbie. The last one. A chronic illness. Chronic illness. Alrighty, hang on to those gifts for a little while. I don't while. want this one. Well, that's not it. <laughs> I am so glad you said that because that's exactly the way life works. Sometimes we get a blessing and even though we didn't choose it, I'm sure whoever got $10,000 was glad they got that blessing. But sometimes we get a chronic illness or a death of a loved one or unemployment. What if God's best gifts are wrapped in the black wrapping paper? What if the heaviest packages, watch this, are full of God's richest grace? What if also, I want you to always consider this, and we're going to come back to this at the end. What if the gift inside only becomes ours as we unwrap that difficult package? You know what? Uh, I can see on the faces, of course, they didn't want these gifts. The ones that were over on this side wanted to give them back. Mm -hmm. And now they've got them. But the truth of the matter is, even though they're ours, there are still things that we have to do as a Christian to properly steward what has come into our lives. Mm -hmm. We see from the life in this passage that, uh, that we're going to read and then from a testimony in Old Testament that you know full well about that a... a Blessing in his life was he was made famous, watch this, because of his trials. Because he chose to properly steward what was given him, God blessed in a great way. He allows both good and bad to enter our lives. In fact, before we even read this passage, I want you to think back to uh, the book of Job. Mm -hmm. I usually don't walk around much on Thursday night. I might walk around a little bit more tonight. Sorry, whoever's controlling that, Brother Mike. <laughs> we first meet Job. He's the wealthiest man in the East. He's blessed. Everything we could all want. Great wealth, close family, leadership in the community. He walks with the Lord. Everyone who's around him respects him. And yet what happens in one day? He loses it all. He loses all his prosperity. He loses all his family except for his wife which may not have been a good thing either because she is the one that was against him. Soon he loses his health as well. He, he didn't lose his life, but sometimes we see in Scripture, you don't have to turn there, that he wishes he did. It, I mentioned his wife. He, he didn't lose his wife, but he lost her support. Dost thou retain thine integrity, curse God, and die? Job 2.9. And Job made a choice in that moment facing a reality in his life, trials that were darker than his worst nightmare could have ever conceived. I'm just going to turn this one this way, Ian. Thank you. And I'll just keep hold of this one. He chose, watch this, to steward his trial. Mm -hmm. he receiving it as though it was coming from God's hand. Mm -hmm. Hold on a minute. Was it? No. What happened in Job's life? Satan met with God. What did he say? And God said, if you consider my servant Job, Satan says, let me at him. God says, go for it. So this is from Satan. And yet Job still chose to steward his life as if it was coming from God's hand. He responds to his life in Job 2.10. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? It's not as though he pretended his trial didn't hurt. We see that throughout the rest of the, the passage. He says in Job 30, 26, When I looked for good, then evil came unto me. When I waited for light, then came darkness. And yet he chose to patiently endure until he found good on the other side. I can't imagine what he went through. And yet he chose to steward it. What words of pain or fear have you heard recently? What frightening doctor report? 
What warning from a boss? Or a, a pink slip? A threat? A criticism? A rejection? The list can go on. Stewarding trials is not something we want to uh, talk about and certainly enjoy, but it's a unique aspect of stewardship because it's almost a contradiction. How do you steward something over which you have no control? Over which you didn't choose in the first place. No one chooses trials. In fact, most of the time, these trials we wouldn't choose. Return to sender. So what do we mean? Stewarding our trials. It's not uh, kind of like we've spoken uh, in regards to the last several weeks of, as far as controlling them. We can't control it. It's not like budgeting our money, scheduling time and rest like we've discussed. But it's a choice instead, watch this, to receive the trial with acceptance, with a yieldedness, so that God is free to work in our lives and bring good from it. You know, kids are having a good time tonight. That's all right. You know, the trials in your life won't bring good if you don't allow it. Well. Pastor, it says uh, that all things work together for good to them that love God to them. Yeah, but you got to choose that. You got to. It's not going to happen by proxy. It's not going to happen just because. But when we receive trials as from the Father's hands, as if it's from God, rather than resisting it, and we trust Him, then we can steward it with God's grace. He works miraculously, growing us, blessing us but especially in three certain areas. We're only going to get through one tonight. As I was going through this, I didn't even know if we'd get through one. I don't want to rush through it all, so we're going to split it up a little bit because we need to understand this. Our first uh, thought in stewarding trials and the blessing that comes from it, number one in your notes there is humility. Humility. You know, all of us have a propensity toward pride. Got to take care of number one. Got to make sure everybody notices me. That's our natural human response. We want to be greater and greater and others to recognize our greatness. We haven't looked at our passage yet, so let's do that. In 2 Corinthians 12, we have a Christian in the first century who had any and every reason to boast. This was Paul. But if there's ever a reason that Paul had to boast, we're going to find it in this passage. He literally was allowed to view the third heaven. Watch it. Verse number one. It's not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I'll come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Notice verse two. I knew a man. We're going to talk about this in a minute. He speaks of himself in the third person. He's speaking of himself here. In Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God know it. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Mm. Consider that for a moment. If you and I had that privilege, I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. I would have returned from that vision and written a book about it. Contacted new stations, would have let everybody know as much as possible. <laughs> Lined up interviews, seminars, how to see heaven and what to do when you get there. Or, I don't know, something like that. Paul could have done this as well. He could have profited from this financially in that day. He could have garnered recognition and respect from his trip to heaven, but he didn't. He didn't even speak of it except for this one time, and it was 14 years later. And even then, he did it in the third person. I wonder why. You can speculate. God had used the very buffeting of Satan to work the sweet fruit of humility in Paul's life. Many scholars believe this happened. Uh, we, we've read about this experience in Acts. And during his first missionary journey in the region of Galatia, he was in Lystra and Derby and was cast out of the city and stoned and left for dead. That may have been when he sees heaven. Maybe that's why he didn't bring it up because it was a time he almost died or did die. And yet Paul himself refers to 
to his thorn, this messenger of Satan, as having a divine purpose. We're going to see it in a moment, but look down in verse number seven. Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Notice the messenger of Satan. It's above it. Lest I should be exalted above measure. He says it at the beginning of verse seven, lest I should be exalted above measure. And at the end of verse seven, lest I should be exalted above measure. What humility. That Paul recognizes, look, there's something that's happened in my life and it's not for me to brag about. In fact, difficulty came as a result of it. You and I can fake humility, but we can never manufacture it. Can never, uh, it's, it's a grace that's developed through the process, watch this, of seeing our frailty and God's strength. Mm. Seeing that we're not enough. Watch this. Seeing that we can't handle it. Seeing that we don't have the answer. And realizing that God does. That's a humility there that God gives us. Problems, difficulties, heartaches remind us that we're dependent upon God. For everything. In our good times, we might attempt to live life and do ministry in our own strength. But when trouble comes our way, what happens? We see our frailty. And oftentimes we return humbly to God for help. So one way we can steward our trials is by humility. I want us to notice underneath humility, first of all, the presence of the trial. The presence of the trial. Notice verse number five as we continue back in our passage. He just got done saying in verses two, three, and four uh, of his experience going to heaven. In verse five, of such an one will I glory. Yet of myself, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I should not be a fool. Or I'll say the truth, but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me. I want us to see in just a moment, he's going to mention his thorn in the flesh. Uh, different Bible scholars, they kind of have, there's two main schools of thought of what Paul's thorn in the flesh might be. The Bible doesn't tell us specifically. Some think it's his constant, the continual persecution that he faced on his missionary journeys. If you're with us on Sunday nights, we're seeing that over and over and over again. The unbelieving Jews uh, kicking him out, stoning him, leaving him for dead, uh, putting him in prison, putting him in prison again. Some people think that was. Other people, uh, myself included on this one, think Paul is speaking of an incurable eye disease that he had, hindered his effectiveness in ministry. Uh, there are different passages, especially in Galatians. Uh, he tells the, the church at Galatia, I bear you record that if it impossible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. That's perhaps he, maybe his infirmity in the flesh. Those Christians in Galatia loved him so much that perhaps they would have been willing to meet the greatest need of his life, which seemed to be healthy eyes. But whatever it was, persecution, a physical difficulty, it was an unrelenting reality, a constant and painful burden in Paul's life. The presence of the trial was there. And to Paul, it felt confining. To the point he believed he could minister better without this thorn in the flesh. And we see this in our passage. Three times he urgently pleads with the Lord to take it from him. We read verse 7. There was a thorn in the flesh given me. Look in verse eight. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. A severe trial bringing real and constant pain. Let me ask you, you have a thorn? Something in your life constantly bothers, <coughs> hinders you? Something so real you can't ignore it? Or overcome it. We see the presence of the trial leads us, second of all, to the purpose of the trial. There in your notes. 
the purpose of the trial. It's very clear Paul preached a tremendous message, traveling all over the world, uh, preaching the news of salvation, the gospel through grace, planting churches, discipling conflict, uh, converts, raising leaders, continuing the, continuing the work. It's obvious the Holy Spirit uses Paul. He pens much of the New Testament. Uh, at 13 of the 21 epistles, almost half or not over half of the entire New Testament, he uses Paul. And what about Paul himself? Was his life consistent with the message he preached? Would his life, and his, I'm sorry, would his message withstand an investigation of his personal life? We're there in, in 2 Corinthians 12. Look back in 2 Corinthians 11, the chapter before. We get a fuller glimpse of the life of Paul here in this letter. We see a, an overview in Acts. We're going through that on Sunday nights, but we see some specifics in 2 Corinthians the most biographical of any of his letters. He gives an account of his suffering. Notice verse 24, chapter 11. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. <laughs> one time would be enough. He got five. Thrice was I beaten with rods. <laughs> Again, once is enough. He got it three times. Once was I stoned. Thrice I sh suffered shipwreck. <laughs> Once is enough. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. In perils by my own countrymen. In perils by the heathen. In perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness. In perils in the sea. In perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness. In watchings often. In hunger and thirst. In fastings often. In cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily. The care of all the churches. Wow. Those first few verses are difficult physically. And then he said, um, we're not even talking about the spiritual side of this. I can testify that's a constant thing. Mm -hmm. he, he, he went through it. I would say that after reading of his suffering and his determined heart and his persistent hope, we see perhaps the reason for his success. Much of it came not from the churches he planted or the suffering he endured, but his difficulty which he carried throughout his ministry. Again, look at it in verse 7 of our text. 2 Corinthians 12, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. Here's what Paul came to the understanding of. The presence of the trial in his life was there, the thorn in the flesh, but he understood the purpose of it. Yeah. I've gone through all this, and while I do, Christ's strength and his grace is so strong in my life, I'd rather go through it so I can have his strength. Well, why do you think he ended up going through all this? Because the Lord knew he was going to get the glory. Not Paul, but the Lord. The Lord knew as a Christian that Paul would see that God's strength is better than his own. I don't know if that's why God kind of turned the crank up on the trials of Paul's life because every time he did, God got more glory. That's not something certainly we would choose, but Paul says it's here. I asked for it to go away. I realized it's not. And now I'm thanking God that it hasn't gone away. Now I'm glorying in the strength 
I'm recognizing the purpose. There's the presence of the trial, the purpose of the trial. And third of all, underneath humility, I want us to see the pathway of the trial. I've made mention to this briefly already. You know, one of the most difficult parts of this passage is in verse 7, near the end. The Bible says it was the messenger of Satan to buffet me. The messenger of Satan? Trials are not easy, and yet, in my mind, somehow I think it would be a little bit easier if I knew it came directly from God. I know he loves me, so he's given this to me because I can accept that a little bit more. But Paul somehow knew that his thorn came from Satan. Job's thorns came from Satan. It didn't come from God. It was the messenger of Satan, and he uses the word to buffet me. That's not a word we use often. When we use it, it's for a buffet to eat, right? But this is the word buffet here. What does that mean? It means to strike with a fist, to give one blow, one a blow. It's what Jesus endured at the hands of the soldiers before he was crucified. Mark 14 tells us some began to spit on him, to cover his face, and to buffet him, to strike. It's what the child of God may endure at the hands of Satan. Job's story identifies Satan as the provoker of our pain. Who instigated Job's losses, stole his wealth, killed his children, destroyed his health? It was all triggered by, triggered by Satan. Job 1, 9 through 11 say this. And Satan's blows in a Christian's life, here we're almost done. Satan's blows in a Christian's life would be overwhelming. If it weren't for God's protection. Job's sorrow, Paul's pain, reveal a comforting truth. Watch this. Don't miss this. It's from Satan, but it reveals a comforting truth. Even Satan can go no further than what God allows. Satan's not allowed to bring free will destruction in your life. Watch this. He's leashed by the sovereignty of God. Have a dog on a leash. It can do some damage unless the owner's bigger and has a leash. And it's as if there are times Satan may be used, the messenger of Satan to buffet us, but it's always, if you're a Christian, on the leash of God's sovereignty. God has his protective hand on our lives. And so because of that, we can remember this, no matter what comes our way, it may not be sent by God, but it's filtered through his hands. Absolutely nothing enters our lives as a Christian accidentally. God allows nothing in our experience that he doesn't have the power to redeem for our good and his glory. So he's given us a promise. We referred to this earlier. It would be unbelievable had it been made by any human. But because it's made by our loving Heavenly Father and our sovereign God, it gives us hope. And that's the promise that we know that all things work together for good. For them that love God, to them are the called according to his purpose and all things includes loss and physical pain, and suffering, mental anguish, Loneliness, slander, cancer, persecution, all things. And that even includes the messenger of Satan. When we choose to receive the trial, understanding the, the presence of the trial and realizing the purpose that God can strengthen me as a result of this. The pathway of the trial may not be from God, but it's filtered through his hands. I can trust him. In fact, oftentimes God wants to work in our lives and mold us to become like his son. We don't understand his ways. By the way, don't try to figure out what that package is for. We don't understand his ways. We don't understand uh, all that goes on all the time. We wouldn't choose these gifts. And yet, sometimes, when we choose to receive it, after all, those bad gifts, 
There's something more inside. There's something greater inside. There's, uh, how about the, uh, let's choose one. Who had the chronic uh, illness? Miss, Miss Debbie, open yours up. It was labeled on top, but if she chooses to receive it, what's inside of your box? Ability. Ability. Oh, yeah. Jeremiah, which one did you have? Humility. What What was your uh, top of the box? Wait a minute. He already opened it. Uh oh. <laughs> what was it? Unemployment. Unemployment, we receive that. We choose to see it's from God and we learn humility. humility. Ability. Miss Tanya, you had the other one, the death of a loved one, and we open that and God can give stability. stability. Those are the next two next week. We looked at humility tonight. God can also give us and will give us stability, strength, ability to go through what's there. But only, hear me, we're done. Only if we choose to receive it. Steward of trials. That doesn't mean control it. It means what God has allowed to come into our lives. I'm not going to get bitter. I'm not going to get angry. I'm not going to say, look at this heavy load you've given me to carry. Instead, I'm going to open it up and receive it. See what God has for me as a result of it. My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this evening. Thank you for listening.